guys, this is week five of the Seamless Study. Yes, I'm showing off my pond in the background. I love it. It's almost done. Um, it is pretty much done, actually. Um, but, so, I actually want to clarify something for a minute. Um, last week, I was talking about Bathsheba, and I just kind of skimmed over it. I skimmed over my notes, and... Um, something in my notes kind of confused me where I'd written um, something down that was incorrect. And I just wanted to go back and clarify um, so that you have the full story in case you didn't look for yourself. So, um, so Bathsheba's father was Eliam, and Bathsheba was married to Uriah. So, if you remember, David saw her bathing on a rooftop. He wanted her. He sent a messenger to find out about her, finds out that she has a husband. Um, but he sends a, messen a messenger to her anyways for her to come to him. And she comes and he sleeps with her and she gets pregnant and then she sends word back that she's pregnant. So David writes to Uriah, her husband, and um, she he's like asking him about battle and all this stuff, acting like they're friends. And he invites him to eat and drink with him. He gets him drunk. And he sends this letter, like, the next day with him to give to Joab. And in the letter it says to have Uriah at the front of, um, the, like, the front line of battle. And then to withdraw from him to make sure that he dies. Um, and so Joab does that. And he ends up dead. And then, um... He stages it to look like an accident, and so they come back, they tell Bathsheba that her husband has died, and she takes some time, and she mourns, and when she's done mourning, um, he takes her as his wife, which really, um, when I think about it, is just like such a disgusting thing all around, but not only did he kill her husband, I don't know that he ever told her that he did that. Um, I think he just let her believe that he died in battle as an accident, and then, um, you know, she mourned that, this man that she loved, and, um, not knowing that the man that she would marry actually ordered to have him killed, and, um, I just, like, when I look at David and I look at that story, I think, like, you're, like, the lowest of low, dude, like, that's disgusting, you're pathetic, you're a jerk. And I don't see, like, all the great qualities in him. Like, at that point, I've just written him off. I'm like, you're a piece of crap. On to the next guy. I don't want to hear about you anymore. Why are you even in the Bible? Like, that's me. That's my selfish way of thinking. Not selfish. That's just, like, my human way of thinking. Like, okay, this guy's a piece of crap. Um, and that's how I viewed him in the story. But yet, God, you know, we look at what we can see and what we know but God looked at his heart, and he was so much more than that one mistake. Um, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And yet in this story, it's hard to believe that at times. It's like, this guy was a man after your own heart? This guy's a piece of garbage. But um, the cool thing about God is he sees the parts of us no one else can see. He sees our hearts. He sees our potential. And he also sees our biggest mistakes, but he doesn't let that define his plan for us or his purpose for us or who he's called us to be. And, um, you know, he, he chose David to be king, and, um, and he was a great king. He made a horrible mistake here, and it says that displeased God. Um, nothing about this was okay with God. He was not pleased with what he did. It was very sinful. It was very lustful. It was very out of his flesh, how he acted. But yet, we all do that at times. We all act out of our flesh. Maybe it's not to this degree. Maybe we think we're better than others because we didn't do something like this. But yet, when we lie, when we manipulate situations, when we do different things, we're just as sinful. And the Bible says that no sin is greater than the other. So it's very easy for me in my self-righteousness to look at situations and be like, oh yeah, well I did this, but like, I'm not like that person. I didn't do this much and, um, and I can justify my sin that way, um, which is ridiculous, honestly, because, um, 
you know, we're all sinners. None of us are more righteous than the other. None of us are God's favorite. None of us are higher than the other. But yet we like to put sin on pedestals and be like, well, this is like a little sin and this is a bigger sin. Like sin is sin and we're all sinful. Um, and I think that's something I need to like realize too um, is just, you know, there isn't like different levels of of righteousness or of like good deeds that I could do or um, that make me better than anyone else. Like we're all sinners. We're all in need of God's grace. And, um, and just most importantly, like the world might look at you and write you off and think like you're a jerk and you're a piece of crap and that might be their opinion. And um, God doesn't make pieces of crap though. He, you know, he loved David and um, he saw all the good in him when it would be so easy to look at the situation and be like, but dude's not worth anything. Like he's a piece of crap. And like, I keep saying that, but it's like, it was my first thought. Like if I knew someone in this day and age that did that, um, I would just be like disgusted and I would want nothing to do with them. Um, but it's such like a hypocritical thing for us to be that way because we do things all the time. Um, and it would be so easy for God to look at us and to be disgusted and to be like, you have nothing to do with me. Like, uh, that's it. Your name's crossed out of the book of life, going to hell and write us off for our sins. But yet he offered us a chance at redemption and at salvation and he wipes our sins away. And, um, I just really think that's, you know, something that I need to work on is not judging people by their past or allowing myself to be judged by my past. A lot of times I think we're our, our hardest critics. We, um, you know, we, we think about the things that we've done in the past and it almost hinders us from furthering our relationship with God. And we, we think about those situations and we feel so guilty and we feel not worthy to worship him or to be with him or to be in his presence but yet he is continually pursuing us and waiting there for us and I think sometimes the hardest thing is just forgiving ourselves and um and just really being able to move forward in freedom that he's already given us if we just accept it um so with that being said I hope it didn't just seem like I just kept calling David a piece of crap even though I know I said that like 10 times um I just think it's so telling of, you know, um, we can look at things and we can judge things with our eyes, but God knows the whole situation. He knows the heart. Um, he knows the person that he created and he doesn't let those mistakes define us. So we shouldn't either. Um, and that was kind of just piggybacking off of last week. Cause that's not actually in our lesson for this week, but I did want to clarify cause I kind of was a little bit confused about it, so I went back and reread um, Samuel chapter 11, and I just wanted to share that with you all, and then we'll get started in week five. So, week five starts out, um, we're going to talk about the Messiah, and we're going to do that by starting with the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. So, the Gospels are the first four chapters of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they're all basically like the same story for the most part. Um, and it's really just like their encounters with Jesus and their different perspectives, um, how they interpreted the stories, the, the things that they saw. Um, so we're going to start with Matthew and Luke. And if you go to Matthew chapter one, uh, the very first chapter is the genealogy of Jesus. And to be honest, when I used to read the Bible, and I got to stuff like this, I would just completely skip over it because it was just like a bunch of names that I can't pronounce and I didn't see the point in it really even being there. I was like, okay, cool. All these names, um, not like really many that I would use for baby names or anything. Uh, didn't really see any point to it, so I would just skip over it. Well, doing this study, I can now look over these genealogies and such a message just in this genealogy just looking at Jesus's family tree so I'm going to read it to you and you might even recognize some names um, as we do 
So this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David. David, the guy that we were just talking about. Jesus, the son of David. Um, the guy that, in my opinion, and my fleshly thinking, is a piece of garbage. Yet, Jesus comes from this man's family line, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So we're going to go back. Um, we're going to just talk about God's promises. You know, he told um, Abraham, I will make your name great on earth. And he told David, all the people will be blessed through you. Um, David and Abraham, he says these things too. And, um, you know, he keeps his promises. We can trace how God keeps his promises. He does through Abraham and then Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel. Um, and when I look at Jacob, I don't feel like he was that deserving of like being this huge part of God's story. In, you know, he was a manipulator from the very beginning. But yet, God saw his heart too. And not only that, is he made a promise to Abraham. And Jacob is a part of that family lineage, and he fulfilled his prob promise, maybe not because Jacob was so deserving, but because God is a God that keeps his promises, and he made that promise, and he intended to fulfill it. And so we have, you know, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father, father of Isaac, the father of Jacob, which we just talked about. Um, Jacob was the father of Judah. I've spoken about Judah before. You know, he slept with his daughter-in-law, who was disguised as a prostitute. And he was going to have her killed when he found out that she was pregnant. And then realized that she was carrying his child. And she said, you know, um, he said, she's more righteous than I. So here's this guy. All these guys that I look at and I'm like, this is who God designed for Jesus to descend from. And, um, there are certainly more righteous people in the Bible, um, that I feel like he could have picked, but yet none of us are righteous, not one. And so to think like that, it's just, again, it's my fleshly thinking and I had to work on that and, you know, how I view things because God doesn't view any of these people as better than anyone else. Um, but he did choose to honor these people and allow them to be a part of Jesus' family. Not just like, you know, we're all a part of Jesus' like, heavenly family. But these were like his blood fa family. These are his relatives that he was born into. And um, a lot of them were like the lowest of the low, the worst of the worst. But yet, they had these different encounters with God. And they put faith in God at different times. And... Um, and I believe that all of them were honored for different reasons, and that's why they are specifically a part of Jesus' story. Not that this is just like a coincidental family line. Like, I think um, all of these people were deserving to be in this genealogy. So then, not only with Judah, um, if you remember, Judah's mother was Leah, and she gave that sacrificial praise when she had him. And she said, you know, this time I will praise God. And I think, you know, him being a part of this genealogy, she was also a part of this genealogy, so is Jacob. She doesn't mention, because this is most of the men that are mentioned, but yet she was a part of his genealogy. And I feel like God was just blessing her for her, um, her faith and her endurance. And she was put in a situation that none of us would want to be in. She was married to a man that never wanted her. From the beginning, he wanted her more attractive, um, better sister, and yet she was stuck in this situation, and she took her eyes off her situation, and she praised God anyways, and she kept her faith, and, um, you know, God blessed her for that. So that's just another one. That's in verse 2. So we continue, Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Ab Aminadab, Aminadab the father, father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, I think that's Salmon, uh, it's spelled like our Salmon, so, uh, Salmon or Salmon, I don't know, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, 
Okay, Rahab was a prostitute. And when the spies went to, I want to say they went to scout out Jericho, I'm pretty sure, but I'm just going to say that just in case I got it wrong. Um, they stayed in her home and she hid them. And people came looking for him to kill them, God's people. And she hid them and she lied for them. And then she said, you know, please remember me and spare my family. So when they came back to destroy the city, um, she had a red cord hanging out her window to identify that's who she was. And, um, you know, she, um, we, we talked about this in church, actually. She was like a, um, I want to say she was a Moabite. So there was like Moabites and Ammonites, and they were the two that were Lot's daughter's children which were born from an incestual relationship with their father. Um, if you remember that story, they were a whole hot mess of their own. They got him drunk and slept with him so that they could have children. So these were like these wicked people. And um, they were always like looked down on. God's people didn't want anything to do with them. But yet Jesus came and abolished that and was like, um, you know, this woman chose to um, to honor me and to trust in me, and she has a place in, in our history, in our lives in heaven one day, and, um, it made me think of this study I was doing this week, um, where it was about one of the, one of, like, Jesus's followers, and he had this dream about eating unclean, um, food, like, meat, and he was like, no, like, I would never do that, I don't eat like that, and then, um, Jesus revealed to him what he was saying was like these people that he deemed unclean that um, that he wanted nothing to do with like they could still be followers of Jesus and they should be accepted and they should be ministered to just as much and so he had to have a heart change there and um, that was kind of the same thing here with Rahab was she wasn't one of the people that they were really supposed to like be around in that day but yet, she was breaking down these barriers, these discriminations, this, um, these walls that they put up between different groups of people and said, no, you're all my children. There is no, like, separating, segregating, like, I came for everyone. And so we have Rahab. Um, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. David, the father of Solomon. So if you remember Solomon, he had like a million wives, um, and that, that's all I'm going to say about him. But yet, um, so, you know, none of these people are perfect, but yet God saw something in them. He saw their heart. Um, he made Sol Solomon was one of the wisest men um, ever, like the wisest man, um, very intelligent, and so Solomon's mother was, had been Uriah's wife. Um, Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the far, father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon. Ammon, the father of Josiah. I love Josiah. I named my son after him. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not, okay. He, um, he became king at eight years old, and he basically went in and, like, fixed everything that was corrupt in the government. And, um, honestly, when I look at Josiah, I feel like he's one of those, like, righteous people that deserves to be in this genealogy. But yet, again, none of us, are righteous, and I don't know why I think like that, um, we shouldn't think like that, because God deemed all of these people worthy, and, um, all of us, he, we're his children, and he loves us, and he has a plan for us, and he designed us uniquely for a purpose, and nothing that we do can ever tarnish that, nothing that people say about us can tarnish that, um, sometimes we, like, self-destruct, we, believe the lies of the enemy, we believe the lies that people say about us, we lie about ourselves, and we put ourselves down, and we don't believe in the word that God um, gave us to stand on, but um, we're all, not like, not that we're worthy or we're righteous, because we're not, 
but he chose us and he set us apart and he um, has a purpose for us and we're not going to be perfect none of us like we are all going to sin we're sinful people um, we weren't created to be that way but yet we are and um, you know so just again just how I feel like that's just what God's been speaking to me is that um, I struggle with it a lot actually like I'll be doing really good and then I'll have like one day a week where I just feel like shut down and I start replaying things from my past and um, I just get like really depressed and God's like that is not who you are and that is not who you've ever been those might be things that you've done but they're in your past and you're a new creation and you don't have to live there anymore so I take a deep breath in I take a breath out and I keep going because if you live in your um if you live in your sorry Kevin just posted something and it popped up about Josiah liking refried, refried beans, or Grayson liking refried beans, and it kind of made me laugh, but, um, if you, um, live in your shame and your guilt, it will just consume you and destroy you, so you have to have faith, you have to believe in Jesus, and you have to know that he already paid the price for anything that you could possibly do, and you have to accept that forgiveness and that freedom, and truly free yourself, and sometimes you have to do it, like, I do it, like, once a week. I have to, like, let go of all of that. And, you know, some people might let go and just let go and go on. But I feel like I'm a little harder on myself. I beat myself up about things. And um, just let it go. You know, we weren't created to dwell in our misery and our shame and our guilt. We were, li we were created to live in freedom. And freedom with God and just His peace and His presence. We weren't created to live with depression and anxiety. And those are things that come through living in this sinful world but yet we can conquer that and Jesus already conquered that and he gives us the the freedom and the ability to live in peace with him um we just have to seek him like continually not just like go say a prayer and and think like oh I'm gonna be healed like you continually spend time with God and you will notice that he changes your life you'll have more peace you'll have more joy all the things that you've been searching for that you haven't been able to attain will come easy um so let's see, I was at Josiah, Josiah the father of Jeconiah, his brothers at the time of exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of uh, she, she I don't know, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abahad, Abahad the father of Elikim, Elikim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, Achim the father of Elihud, Elihud the father of Eliezer, Eliezer, the father of Matthan, Matthan, the father of Jacob, um, so this is a second Jacob, um, and that's, like, one thing that I've kind of gotten confused in the Bible, too, like, there's a couple different Marys, there's a couple different Josephs, there's a couple different, um, people, and sometimes when I read the stories, I think they're talking about the same people, but they're not, um, so, um, sometimes you just kind of have to go back and clarify who they're talking about, but, so then we have Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile of Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. So, um, we can go back to when, um, when God talked to Abraham and said, like, I will make your descendants as numerous as like the grains of sands or the stars in the sky, um, and, and see that, um, and he said, you know, all the people on earth will be blessed through you, and we can see that he kept that promise because through him came Jesus, and we've all been blessed through Jesus, so that's exactly what he was talking about way back hundreds, if not thousands of years earlier, he made that promise, and he held to it, um, so then we have, um, there's just like all of these prophecies that are fulfilled throughout this, um, this week's study. And it talks about, you know, how the Holy Spirit came to Mary and said that she would, um, have a virgin birth and that his name would be Emmanuel, God with us. Like that is who Jesus is. He is God with us. Um, it says a child is born and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Ever Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Like Jesus is the Prince of Peace. 
Um, and if we accept that, I feel like, you know, just once again, having Jesus in our lives, um, we're still going to face things. We're still going to struggle. We're still going to, you know, go through things. But we have that Prince of Peace as our source to go back to. And without it, like, I don't even know how I could function. But, um, so then we have, you know, Matthew 2, 5. He's the ruler of Israel. Micah 5, 2. Um, it says, a small clan of Judah will come. Out of a small clan of Judah will come Ruta, ruler of the world. Um, and that's exactly whose tribe he came from. He came from Judah's. And um, that was prophesied. And Luke Three, I mean, in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, Caesar Augustus ordered for a census. Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem because he belonged to the line of David. So, um, in Matthew 2, 1 through 2, he's born as king of the Jews. Matthew was a Jew. Um, Matthew two sixteen, he ordered for all the boys two years and under to be killed. And God spoke to Joseph in a dream, so they fled to Egypt. Um, in Hosea 11.1, 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. That's back in Hosea. That is God saying he saw Jacob as a child, he loved him, and he, um, he called for his son to, be, to come from their line. Um, it says... So Luke was a Greek, a Gentile, and he portrays Jesus as a man. If you read the book of Luke, you'll see Jesus portrayed as a man. He's the Son of God. If you read Luke chapter 3, um, verses 23 through 38. Um, so basically, a Gentile was anyone who wasn't a Jew. Um, a Jew was like God's chosen people. And yet... Luke shows up, and he's a Gentile, and he's like, hey, God didn't just come for, like, his people, his chosen people. He came for all of us. Not, you know, like, in our day, it would be like, God didn't come for just, like, this one group of people. Or, um, you know, there's so much, you know, there's racism now. There was racism back then. Um, a lot of groups of people wanted nothing to do with each other just because of where they were from, who they were. But yet, Luke steps up and says, hey, look, Jesus isn't just for one group of people, for the Jews. He's for all of us. Um, so in Luke 2, 39 through 52, um, basically, Mary and Joseph go on a road trip and forget to bring Jesus. And they find Jesus in a temple. And he's like, this is my father's house. Um, so we have, this. now we're on day two. This is the Gospel of Mark. Um, talks about John the Baptist. Um, and the book of Mark, it depicts Jesus as a servant. So we have Luke. It shows Jesus as a man. You know, he was a carpenter. He came as a human. He came a humble life. He, you know, worked a hard job. And, um... Now we have Mark. It shows him as a servant. And I put under here, study Mark to become a better wife. You know, um, Jesus was a servant. If I want to be more like Jesus, I need to serve. I need to serve my family. I need to serve in my church. I need to be a servant. And um, that's who Jesus was. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. And so um, in Isaiah 40, verse 3, and Matthew Three, one through six, you'll see that John and Jesus are cousins. Um, Matthew three fourteen, um, John goes to Jesus and's like, "I need to be baptized by you," and yet Jesus was like, "No, like you're gonna baptize me." And he's like, "Why would I baptize you? Like you need to be the one baptizing me." Um, Matthew three eleven through twelve instructs us to be baptized by water. And fire of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus begins his ministry and he doesn't do it alone. He has 12 disciples. And I really feel like this should be our, um, like, s not structure, but that's kind of, I'll roll with that word because I can't think of what I'm trying to say. This should be like our example of, of what church should be like. Jesus is not, um, very rarely does he 
get together huge crowds of people and um, to do, you know, to do his teachings and everything. He does life with these 12 guys. He wakes up, he does life with them, he eats with them, he fishes with them, he does what needs to be done. He loves on them. Uh, he cares for the poor and um, loves his enemies and shows them how to pray and teaches them the golden rule. And, um, you know, I feel like that's what church should be. Is I think a lot of times we, you know, we think about the numbers and like how many people go to our church and all these different things. But yet, um, I did a study in one of my college classes by Francis Chan and they're like really big on house churches because for one, like you can cut down on the cost. If you, um, if you have to run a building and do all these things, you have like tons and tons of cost. So he said, you know, we can still have like 500 people or whatever, but if we do it with like a huge building, it's going to cost like so much money. If we, gr if we break up into like so many groups of 20 or 25 or whatever, and we meet in houses and we don't have those expenses, we can be more effective, not only with our money and our resources to touch others and those that don't know Jesus, but we can be closer. We can have a community. And that's what Jesus was all about, was loving others and just like having that community. Um, you know, I've been at churches where they wouldn't have known if I was there or not because there were so many people there. And not that that's a bad thing, not that I'm against mega churches or anything like that, but, um, you know, I want that fellowship. I want that closeness where um, if I'm not there, I want someone to notice and be like, hey, are you doing okay? I want that accountability. And, um, and I feel like that is the example that Jesus set for us of, like, how we should live. We should live with other believers um, and, you know, and not just keep it within the walls of our church or our building, but we should take it with us. We should care for the poor. Um, we should do those things. And so in Matthew 10, 1, it talks about driving out impure spirits and healing every disease and sickness. Like, Jesus didn't just come to, to be here and be like, oh, I'm the Son of God. Like, he came to heal you and to deliver you and, um, and just to show God's power and God's glory through that. But also because he wants you to be healed. And, um, you know, he didn't, we weren't intended to live with sickness and death and all of these things. But yet, you know, there was the fall of man and we did that to ourselves. And, um, you know, he wants to heal you. He wants you to come to him no matter how broken you are, no matter what you've done. He wants to heal you. But he's not going to, you know, he's not, he's a gentleman. He's not going to just intrude without you inviting him in. So, um, we have Matthew 10 verses 5 through 6. It talks about Israel. Um, and it says, God wants his people to return to him. I feel like that's just another message for like the day that we're in. Um, you know, I don't know when God's coming back. Nobody does when Jesus is coming back. But I do feel like, um, I've never felt like it was closer in my lifetime than it is now. Um, and I want to be ready for that. I want to be working in the field when he comes back. Um, so, let's see. Um, we have Matthew 10.22. Um, Matthew 13.18-23. through I put, it is our job to plant the seed but we're not responsible for how it's received. Um, you know, it says that sometimes you're going to throw seed and it's going to fall on ground that's not ready to hear it. And um, some are going to grow and some are not. But it's our job to spread the seed. Um, we have Matthew 16, 21. And it says, He will be killed and raised. Zechariah 9, 9. Ow! The cat bit my leg. Um, it says that he'll come in riding a donkey. Or that he did. And religious leaders were threatened by Jesus. Um, they were hungry for power and they killed him. Come here. Why are you being mean? Um, this cat. So we're now on day three. This is Gethsemane. Um, 
it's Matthew 26, 1 through 5, talks about he would be crucified. The chief priests, the elders in the palace of high priest, uh, I don't know how to say his name. A crowd might start a riot. Um, they didn't want to spec a spectacle to distract them from keeping their customs and traditions. They didn't want anything to threaten their position or authority. I think that's something that some churches need to, um, to be aware of. Um, I feel like there are churches that it's almost like a country club. They like what they're doing. They feel like it's about them. It's about what they're doing. And they don't invite Jesus in because they don't want it to change the atmosphere. They're, they like their traditions. They like their customs. And they're afraid if they invite Jesus in, you know, it's going to threaten their position, their authority. That's a dangerous thing. If you feel like you're in a church where Jesus is not welcome, that is not a church and you need to leave. Um, that's just like a whole other side note. But that's who the people were, the religious leaders back then. They were threatened by Jesus. They were hungry for power, so they killed him. I don't want to be associated with anyone who is threatened by Jesus and wants more power than him. That is why the devil was kicked out of heaven. He was an angel. He wanted to be more powerful than God, and he was kicked out of heaven for it. So if you're around a group of people that seem like they make everything about them and they want their focus to be on them and not God, you need to get away from those people because I've been there and it is not a healthy place to be. Um, so I put, there was like a few questions on here and I answered it and I said, you know, I've been afraid to publicly share my beliefs in front of a crowd where I knew it would upset the people. Um, you know, and who do I fear? Do I fear God or do I fear men? And there have been a lot of times in my life where I've feared men. And it's like one thing that I still struggle with to this day is I fear what people will think about me. I fear, um, you know, people's opinions and just different things. And it's ridiculous. But for an example, like I have a few friends on Facebook that are gay and I love them. And they're some of the sweetest people that I know. And I absolutely love them. Um... And I would never want to, like, say anything to belittle them or to hurt their feelings or to upset them. Um, but yet, so I, I rarely ever share anything against homosexuality so that I don't upset them. Um, quite like Jonah not wanting to preach in Nineveh, you know? Um, just like, but yet, I do believe that that's wrong. You know, it says in the Bible that it's an abomination. Not just, like, homosexuality. I'm not just, like, attacking that one group. But there are so many things that the Bible clearly says is wrong that people want to fight for. Abortion. Transgender. Um, now we have this pedophilia sexual orientation ordeal, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I don't know anyone that's that I personally know that is, like, pushing for that. But I feel like not that long ago, a lot of people were speaking out against homosexuality, against abortion. And the desire to not offend anyone um, has silenced us, has silenced us from speaking the truth. And I don't say these things in a mean or a judgmental way because I have friends that have had abortions. I have friends that are gay. And I love these people, and God loves these people, but I do believe that that is wrong, and I'm going to speak out against it because I think it needs, you know, the Bible says, speak up for those that can't speak for themselves, and, um, you know, we could go back and forth all day about different issues that um, I think really just goes back to a heart problem and to sin and to selfishness and um I'm not going to get into it at all right now but um I want to be obedient and not concerned what people think but um I just want to be obedient to God and um there's just like different scripture references that you can look back over if you want 
Matthew 26, 30 through 35, Peter chapter 3, um, Matthew 26, verse 39 and 42, says, May this cup be taken from me, not as I will, but as you will. If it is not possible for this cup to be taken away from me unless I drink it, may your will be done. So this was Jesus pleading to his father um, in a moment of humanity. He was human. He felt the things that we feel. Um, and he, the cup represents the suffering and dying on behalf of a rebellious world. Um, and he's like, you know, I really don't want to, like, be tortured and crucified. But if this is your will and this is the only way, then let your will be done. Um, it says, in the face of accusations, Jesus state, stayed silent. Um, let's see. We have Luke 23, 1 through 2. Um, subverting our nation, doesn't pay taxes to Caesar, claims to be Messiah, King. Um, they said, release Barabbas, who was guilty of murder, and Jesus took his place. Okay. If you haven't ever gotten this, we are Barabbas. Barabbas was guilty, and yet he got to go free, and Jesus took his place. We are Barabbas. Um, we have, this is, I'm just kind of like going through my notes, so it's like it kind of jumps around a little bit, but um, Pilate's wife had a dream warning him not to be a part of Christ's death. You know, this is a believer that's like, hey, like, do not mess with this. Like, you don't want to mess with this. This is the Son of God. Don't you kill him. And she, you know, she warned him of that. <clears throat> So we have, um, we're on day four now, which is the crucifixion and resurrection. Um, there's the scripture, Luke 23, 23. It says, their shouts prevailed, so Pilate granted their demand. You know, his wife, um, she was like, don't be a part of that. And he tried not to. He was like, you know, I don't think this guy's guilty, but the people um, just were relentless and they um, prevailed. So he granted them. Um, I don't want to be someone that is so afraid of men that my fear for God or my fear for men is greater than my fear for God. Like, that is a scary place to be, but yet that is what happened there. Um, so then, you know, he was killed and he rose on the third day. Um, it says... Oh, okay, so it says, it talks about, like, just the, um, what Christ endured for us. It says that when he hung on the cross, that he was sweating drops of blood. And, um, I had a pastor one time that he, you know, he has friends that do marathons, he does marathons, and he said, that is something that happens in, like, hardcore marathons, like, when you're like, almost at the point of death, you sweat blood, like, it's this, um, insane thing, and, um, it said, Jesus stretched out his arms in submission to God, I wish I could go back and find that sermon, because it was just, like, about how, like, painful it would have to be, and, like, how excruciating, how much, like, excruciating pain you would have to be in to, like, sweat blood, and just, like, how, um, it talked about, like, his breathing, and, like, he really, um, just, like, brought that whole story to life, where it was, like, a very visual picture that I could just see, like, how much Jesus bore for us, and, um, so he stretches out his arms in submission to God in worship, um, and then the temple, the curtain of the temple, so if you remember, that was the place where they would go to offer a sacrifice once a year for the people, um, that only the high priest could go in there, they would tie a rope around his leg so that if he did anything wrong and dropped dead, they would drag him out by his ankle because, um, no one else was holy enough to, um, righteous enough, whatever, to go into this place. Like, only the high priest could do that. And, um, so the moment that Jesus is killed, 
is crucified. The curtain in the temple tears from top to bottom. Um, that was the thing that separated us from God. Um, and we're no longer separated from God because of what Jesus did for us. Um, the earth shook, the rocks split, there was an earthquake, tombs broke open, bodies of holy people raised to life. I know a lot of people that have always, like, skipped over this portion of scripture, and it's not something you hear a lot. Like, you hear about the resurrection and everything. Like, this was basically the first zombie apocalypse. Like, tombs break open. There are people that have been dead for years that are raised to life. They come out of the tombs like zombies or ghosts after Jesus' resurrection, and they go into the holy city and appear to many people. Um... If you don't think that that's a supernatural thing taking place, and if you weren't a believer before you killed him, you bet you're a believer now. Because that's just not something that happens every day. Um, so the curtain was torn. We're no longer separated from God. Um, the temple, the curtain, was a separate holy tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant was stored. And yet, um, we don't need that anymore. We can go to God freely through Jesus. Um, talks about, I want to read this small excerpt about Thomas because I skimmed over it in my notes, but I really like the way she words things in this book. So it says, Thomas, in truth, he's the disciple I relate to most. He's gotten a bad rap for being a doubter. He was actually a very loyal follower of Christ. He's packing a punch with his little tirade, but my hunch is that the root is not unbelief. Rather, it's a desperate desire to believe fully. And I get it. I don't question God because I want to prove he doesn't exist. I question because I want to rest in his unshakable, in unshakable faith. I won't get to see the evidence Thomas did, but it's, nef it's worth noting that despite all my, his ranting and threatening, threatening, scripture never tells us that Thomas actually touched the risen Christ. Whatever he saw was enough for him to declare Jesus is his Lord and his God. That gentle reminder weaves its way through all of my days. I believe Jesus says to each of us, You may not get the evidence you say you need to believe in me, but rest assured, love, I'll give you enough. Um, and then we're on day five, which is the beginning of the church. Um, so we have um, Matthew was speaking to the Jews that Christ is the king. Mark was speaking to the Romans that Jesus was a servant. Luke was speaking to the Gentiles, to everyone, um, and portraying Christ as a man. John was speaking to everyone and to believe that they could have a relationship with Jesus. So it says, Go and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, which is radical for this time period. Um, it says Luke 20, I want to say that's 24, it might be 29. Mm, my notes are messy. Uh, 49 says, stay until you have been clothed with power from on high. Acts 2, 1 through 4 says to speak in tongues. Acts 2, 3, uh, 37 through 39 says, what shall we do? Repent and be t baptized. These are all things like, um, speaking of salvation, like, what shall you do to be saved? Um, and um, these are just, like, some instructions from Jesus. So, God picks the least likely candidate to change the world. And that is what proves that it's God. Um, when they accomplish great things. Like, we have David and Goliath. David was the least likely person to win that battle. And yet... God picks those people to prove to the world when it happens that they didn't do it on their own. Um, you know, if it was reversed, if Goliath came in and slain David, then people would have been like, okay, obviously. But it was, it looked impossible to man. And so then when God did it, he was like, surely they will believe that that was me because it was impossible without me. We have... Acts 9, verses 1 through 22. 
Um, they're persecuting Christians, threatening to kill them, throwing them in jail. And I want to say this is Saul. He encounters Jesus. He's blind for three days, healed and filled with the Holy Spirit, and then begins sharing his faith. Okay, I went back and read over Acts chapter 9 just to make sure that with Saul it was later his name was changed to Paul. Um, and now, let's see, actually, I think that is the end of this week. So next is week 6 and that's the last week. Um, let me read just the last page of this, um, week 5. So it says, Acts, read Acts 9, 1 through 22, and record the bones of the story. So that's what I just spoke about, um, Saul, how he persecuted children, uh, per persecuted Christians. And, um, so I'm going to read what she wrote. It says, the hater, the persecutor, the disbeliever, he will come, the man, he will become the man to write nearly half of the books of the New Testament. I just can't even begin to tell you what it means to me. But wait, Saul, what? You don't remember all that many books of the Bible written by a fellow named Saul? You're right. After many people believe that God changed Saul's name to Paul after his conversion, that's not exactly what happened. In fact, God didn't change his name at all. Let me explain. Saul was the Hebrew name given to him at his birth. Paul is the Roman version of the same name. His father was a Roman citizen, thus he inherited citizenship. As someone who is chosen to preach the good news to the Gentiles or non-Jews, he began by going by the name they would be most familiar with. The rest of the book of Acts follows the expansion of the gospel to many different lands by a few key people. We'll keep hearing from Peter and Paul, and we'll be introduced to Timothy, Barnabas, Silas as we go. They're all missionary. God calls to different places to proclaim his truth. We'll even meet a, few, a fellow named James, the half-brother of Jesus. Paul is the main character of Acts. As we read the rest of the book, which I recommend doing when you can make the time, it's a really good read, we'll follow his journeys and eventually his imprisonment and trial. In our last session together, we are going to study his life a little bit more in detail, but I wanted to introduce you before we left the book of Acts. Now when I tell you that the book of Romans was just a letter Paul wrote to the people of Rome, you'll know the, contact, the context to make sense of it. See it all coming together? I can't wait to finish this up with you. Stick with it. You're so close. Um, <clears throat> it really is neat when you just, like, study the, um, like, different parts of history and that time, and everything starts piecing together, and you can make sense of it. And even, like, looking at maps and seeing where um, places were then and what they are called now and the relationships that we have with those people, um, it all started in the Bible. Um, this week we even talked about Caesar Augustus. He's in our history books. So to say that you don't believe in the Bible, that you don't believe in Jesus, that you just think this is a fairy tale book written, um, whatever, but yet no one questioned, you know, our 7th grade, 8th grade history teachers when they taught us history, um, our history. And yet, um, this, this is our history. This is God's history. It goes from the very beginning. And if you go through it, it answers nearly every question that you would ever have about creation, about the different languages around the world, um, how that started. Just like different things that if you really want to know and you study the word, um, God will reveal it to you. And you might not know everything. And I'm sure there will be times that we you know when we get to heaven um, there's still going to be things that we don't understand because we can't fathom everything that God's capable of and everything that, you know, he designed that those are only things that he will be able to comprehend. But yet the Bible does give us a lot of insight to, um, just the way, the way, the way things are, the way that they are. Um, and it is a history book. And if you haven't seen the case for Christ, it's a movie. I would really recommend it. It um, really digs into the history of that time period and gives so much proof for why the Bible is true. Um, I really recommend it. But I'm going to close out um, this week. And um, last week I did like a prayer 
um, for salvation afterwards, kind of. If you want to look back on that video, you can. If you want to reach out to me or to someone that you know. Um, if you have more questions, if you want to talk, if you want to accept Jesus as your Savior, um, reach out to someone or just talk to God. It's as simple as believing in Him. Um, believing that He's God's Son, that He came as a man, that He came of a virgin birth, that He died for your sins, that He was crucified, and He rose again on the third day. Um, you know, confess with your mouth. You believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess your with your mouth that God raised Him from the dead. You will be saved. So it's e as easy as, you know, praying to God that you believe in Him, that you um, accept Him as your Savior, that you want Him in your life, that you invite Him into your life to be the Lord of your life, that you surrender your will to His. Um, it's really as simple as that. Um, but then I would encourage you to get connected with a group of believers and a support system. And, um, you know, honestly, just, um, just seek God and He's not hiding. He's waiting for you to come to him. So that was week five, and we have one more week left, and we'll have gone through the entire Bible. So if you've been going through this study with me, um, thank you so much, and I hope that you've gotten something out of it. And I'll let you go, and I'll see you next week.